Hello everyone, in this episode of What The Fast, we are talking about how clutches work. Now, as a car enthusiast, I'm going to assume that you know how to drive a manual transmission. If you don't, I'm not really sure why you're here. But most enthusiasts prefer driving a manual transmission with a clutch uh, simply because it's more fun. Whether or not a dual clutch or an automatic transmission is quicker or more efficient or better technology, most of us just like to drive a manual because we're in charge of the car. So we're not going to talk to you so much about how to drive it from a practical perspective because we presume that you know how to put your foot on the clutch and change gears. We're going to talk about the engineering side of a clutch so you can better understand how they work, which will help you drive your car better as well as choose the right clutch not only for your car and its power, but the driving application as well because a clutch like with most things in a car you can't always have your cake and eat it as well so first up let's look at how a clutch works from a basic fundamental perspective it's pretty easy actually essentially the clutch's job is to transfer power or torque from the engine to the gearbox or disengage the engine and the gearbox so first up what do you have you have a flywheel a clutch plate a pressure plate uh, and then you have everything else that's required to kind of make them work. So the flywheel is attached to the back of the engine and basically transfers the torque from the engine. A flywheel's got a pretty hard job to do, to be honest. It has to transfer however much power you're making through to the rest of the transmission. It's all stored in the flywheel. Now the pressure plate is exactly what it sounds like. It is a plate that applies pressure. So if you have a look at this pressure plate, you've got these fingers here, which are what apply the pressure, and they push against this plate on the inside. Now, the default position for a pressure plate, if you do nothing to it, is to actually apply pressure. So if you aren't doing anything at all, it will be applying pressure to the clutch plate inside and onto the flywheel. So essentially, a pressure plate and a flywheel sandwich onto the clutch plate. It's as simple as that. The more you clamp that clutch plate, or multiple plates, the more torque you should be able to transfer, until at which you reach a point that either A, the power of the engine is just simply too much, too much torque for that clutch plate to hold, or you overheat the clutch plate, or you wear it down. Any of those things happen, no matter how much you sandwich it together, you might get clutch slip, and the engine will spin faster than the clutch plate itself, because the clutch plate, it sits on the input shaft which goes into the gearbox. So you have an input shaft and gears, and you have an output shaft. Now when you're in neutral, the input and output shaft are not linked. So believe it or not, when you're sitting in your car at the lights and you're idling and you're in neutral and you have your foot off the clutch, the pressure plate is actually clamping onto the flywheel and the clutch plate and it's actually engaged to the input shaft and the input shaft is spinning. That's why some cars when you sit at the lights, especially like a race sort of transmission, you can actually hear the sound of the gearbox spinning when you're at the lights because the input shaft is spinning when you're in neutral sitting at the lights. So when you put your foot on the clutch, put it into first gear, the input shaft is now connected to the output shaft. So therefore, the gearbox is no longer spinning anymore. It's all stationary like the rest of the drivetrain, but the flywheel and pressure plate have been pulled apart, so there's no clamping force on that clutch plate. So let's have a look at it here now. Here's a flywheel, here's a clutch plate. It will sit like that. The pressure plate will sit over the top. You bolt the pressure plate to the flywheel, and you can see the gap here inside the pressure plate is where the input shaft from the gearbox goes into that spline on the clutch plate. Essentially, it's just clamped onto material. It's actually very similar to your brakes. You have a brake rotor, which is like the flywheel. You have the caliper or the piston, which is like a pressure plate. And then you have the brake pad, which is like a clutch plate. All it is is using frictional material and pressure to transfer torque between one thing and another. That's simply what it's trying to do. Now let's take a look at how it works in, in terms of the entire system. I said the default for a pressure plate is that it is forced up onto the clutch plate. It is essentially engaged uh, as its sort of default position. So when you look at the system, you've got your pedal. Now your pedal pushes onto a clutch master cylinder. So basically applying pressure. That hydraulic pressure goes through the clutch line to the clutch slave cylinder. The clutch slave cylinder basically pushes a little rod that pushes against some type of clutch fork pivot arm. Basically, if you've done any sort of basic engineering, uh, 
that clutch fork has to pivot against obviously a pivot point, which is sometimes attached to your gearbox on the inside, can be in various different spots. Uh, and then it pushes against the thrust bearing or throw out bearing, which sits on the fingers of the pressure plate. So this is the thrust or throw out bearing or whatever you want to call it. And that sits on the fingers of the pressure plate. Now in a push style clutch, you will have the clutch fork will basically pivot and push against that bearing. The reason you need a bearing is, well, it's spinning. The clutch fork isn't spinning. That's why you need to have a bearing like this so it can spin. You can imagine this is spinning, the clutch fork is stationary. That's why there needs to be a bearing there. Now in a pull type clutch, it's the opposite. The clutch fork will pull away and the fingers will pull away to disengage. What's the pros and cons of a push versus a pull style clutch? Well, in theory, they just do the same thing. The way they force the clutch to disengage is either via push or pull, but a lot of clutch manufacturers will tell you to switch to a push type clutch, especially in a GTR, just simply because there's more options available for the different type of clutch combinations that you can build. So you'll find that a push type clutch is more common, but some cars do come with them from factory. Late model GDRs, WRX, they're a pull type clutch. So this thrust bearing will eventually be attached to these fingers in a pull type clutch and pull away, while on a push type clutch, the clutch fork is gonna push against those. When it pushes against those fingers, the pressure plate moves away from the clutch and we disengage. Now when it comes to the clutch system, there's actually a lot of engineering and science behind all this. You can change the diameter as well as the thickness of your throw out bearing, which will actually change the way the clutch drives, disengages, engages, and how heavy the pedal is. Where you have your pivot point can be adjusted. How long that clutch fork is can be changed. Uh, the size or the diameter of your clutch slave cylinder determine how heavy your pedal pressure is. The length of the rod can be adjusted. Uh, you can change your clutch line from a factory rubber one to a braided one so it transfers that pressure better. Your clutch master can be a different size. It can have a booster attached to it to help with the pedal effort. And then your pedal itself, the pivot point for that can be changed as well as also you can change the pivot point on there to get a different type of feel on the pedal. Why does this all matter? Well, a lot of people buy a clutch, put it in their car and go, I don't like this. It's too heavy. It's too grabby. It doesn't drive right. But a lot of the times it's not actually the clutch that's the problem. It's actually the way you've got your system set up. You might need to change the diameter of your clutch master and your, your clutch slave purely just due to the fact that you're putting a much heavier clutch in. But if you change those, you can actually make it easier to push the pedal. So your pedal pressure can be changed relative to the pressure plate itself. So you could have a 3,000 pound pressure plate, but you change the rest of your system and you actually change the pedal pressure. A lot of people don't realize that. You need to talk with the clutch manufacturer or talk with your mechanic to work out what the best thing to do in the system is so you can actually get the thing to drive properly. Even little things like you put a new clutch in, you go, oh, doesn't want to disengage all the way. Sometimes you need a slightly shorter or longer rod between the clutch slave and the clutch fork, you may have put the wrong throw out bearing in there. Happens in Nissans all the time. People put the wrong throw out bearing in and their clutch doesn't drive anymore, or it doesn't disengage, or it doesn't engage properly, etc. So you've really got to make sure the system for your clutch is done correctly and adjusted correctly to suit the way the car is going to drive. That is almost a whole other topic, but the problem with that topic is it really is dependent on your car because there are different things that you can buy for different cars to help with that. So if you've bought a clutch that everyone has said is great and it's not working for you, there's a fair chance you just haven't got the rest of your system done correctly. Now, let's go back to talking about the clutch itself, which is what we're talking about in this video. So like I said, the flywheel is what transfers all of the torque to the gearbox and the pressure plate and flywheel, which you can see here, they actually get bolted together. Now, what you've got to remember about that is the entire weight of the flywheel isn't just the flywheel, it's the flywheel and pressure plate together. That's going to be pretty important information as we move into the first topic, which is the flywheel. So the flywheel would seem like the most basic thing to talk about when it comes to a clutch, but it's actually not. And the main reason for that is the misconception that a lighter flywheel is always better. But I'm telling you right now, a lighter flywheel is most certainly not always better. And let me explain why. The flywheel and pressure plate together, as we know, are attached to the engine. So they are transferring all of the torque from the engine. Now, rather than saying torque, let's talk about inertia. So all of the inertia of the engine ends up in the flywheel and pressure plate. Now, if you can imagine, the heavier the flywheel and pressure plate combo, the more inertia it has. In other words, it's harder to stop it as you start to clamp down onto the clutch plate. 
because you've got to remember that the clutch plate is attached to the gearbox, which is attached to the tail shaft, to a diff, and then all of the wheels and tyres. So you have all of this inertia from the drivetrain, but you also have the friction of the wheels and tyres to the ground, which is affected by the weight of the car. So now you've got to fight the weight of the car, the friction, all of that gearbox and drivetrain essential inertia, you need to fight that with the inertia of the flywheel. Now, if you have a really light flywheel, Think about it this way. As you start to put pressure onto the clutch plate, the inertia of the entire drivetrain and car is now trying to fight the inertia of the engine. So if you can imagine, if you have, say, you know, 1,500 RPM and you go to take off, all of that inertia from the drivetrain and the car is just gonna go boom and pull down on that engine, make the revs drop and stall. Now, if you've ever seen race cars, they've got tiny lightweight little clutches on them and they use like four or 5,000 RPM to take off, just like Jet 200. Huge RPM just to get moving. And that's because the inertia of the flywheel is so low and the inertia of the car and all the drivetrain is so high, huge amount of RPM required because as soon as they put a little bit of pressure on that clutch plate, just pulls the revs right down. to remember once the pressure plate is fully engaged uh, over the clutch plate and the clutch is completely engaged it's now all one system so all of this weight of the flywheel and stuff only really matters during that transition now the reason people want a light flywheel is they basically say you're lightening your drivetrain to give better throttle response which is kind of true if you have less inertia essentially what happens is you have just better throttle response the engine picks up easier and it also actually brings the revs down easier as well i don't know if you've ever seen a car with a mega light flywheel uh, and you give it a free rev the end the revs go up very quickly but they also come down very quickly kind of like on a motorbike in a race car with dog engagement that doesn't really matter so much but in a street car that can actually be bad because when you go to change gears you put your foot on the clutch and you go to change gears nice and casually, the revs actually drop too much and you'll find the car will then grab again and be jerky to drive. So the reason why we want inertia in that flywheel and pressure plate is so that when you take off, you get a, actually get a smoother engagement by having more inertia in the flywheel and pressure plate because it's able to counteract the inertia of the drivetrain and the car itself. And same when you change gears, you can imagine you pull that lever, your foot's on the clutch, the revs don't drop as much. Try it, you'll, you'll actually see it. A normal road car, when you change gears, the revs don't drop very quickly. But in a race car or something with a mega light flywheel, those revs drop very quickly and make for a really terrible car to drive, which is why factory cars have a lot of weight to the flywheel and pressure plate. So a heavy flywheel, or I should say a normal flywheel and pressure plate, keeps the car really easy to drive. So all you people out there that go, I want a light and flywheel for my Sylvia for the street, no, you don't, it won't drive better. And then you're gonna say, oh, but I'll get better throttle response. Yeah, but really, you're gonna notice it? Like, it, you're just not, right? It, it, in a circuit car, time attack car, things like that, where you want the revs to be able to go up and down very quickly for good response, you will notice having a lightened flywheel. But honestly, to get a really big improvement, you need to lighten the flywheel, the pressure plate, and all of the clutch plates, bring the diameter right down, and get yourself a proper dedicated race clutch. So don't always be quick to go and get a lightened flywheel. And that carries over to drag racing as well. We'll use our GTR as an example. We have not gone for the lightest possible clutch in our GTR because when you go to launch the car from 8,000 RPM and you've got four drag radials on the car, as you start to release the clutch, same sort of deal. The lighter the flywheel, the more it's gonna to wanna to pull the RPM down and the harder it is to launch the thing. So when we have a twin plate like this, the whole assembly is actually pretty heavy. It can be upwards of 15, 16, even 18 kilos, depending on what brand. So you'll just find you've got that inertia, it makes the car easier to launch. So in a drag application, sometimes not going too light in the flywheel is actually a good thing. But then you have to counteract it with the fact that once you're moving, you've then got more inertia to try and move. So therefore not as responsive, but with drag racing, your RPM and your engine speed is always going up anyway, so it's not as big of an issue as a time attack car where your revs are going up and down all the time and fluctuating as you go around different corners and things like that. So, when it comes to your flywheel, you don't want to go out and lighten the thing and just go for the maximum lightness you possibly can. Because like I said, 
the, the firewall and clutch assembly in our GTR isn't really lightened all that much, but the one in our Silvia, our time attack car, is as light as possible. That thing is terrible to drive. You can't drive it on the trailer. Combined with a long first gear, it's a pain in the ass to drive it around the pits. In fact, I, I wouldn't wish driving that car on the street to my worst enemy. It's not a nice car to drive, but it only ever uses the clutch to leave the pits or to move out of the garage, etc. So once we're moving, we barely use the clutch due to the dog engagement box. We don't have to worry, but the GTR gets driven on the street and gets drag raced, so a heavier firewall actually makes the thing nicer to drive. Now, another thing to consider with a firewall is its ability to hold heat. Now, if you can imagine, if you've taken all the weight out of a flywheel by drilling holes into the outer part of the flywheel or it doesn't connect with anything uh, and tried to make it thinner, get rid of the dual mass part on the inside, the thinner you make it, the lighter you make it, the less ability it has to hold heat. Now, if it can't hold heat, what's it going to do? It's going to distort. It's going to bend. It's going to warp. And if it warps, it doesn't have as much contact patch. What happens? It starts to slip and can also make funny noises and start grabbing and have a few other problems. So when it comes to lightening a flywheel, sometimes it's a bad idea because it can't hold the heat. Uh, the other thing to look at when it comes to the design is if you get rid of the dual mass part of a flywheel by making it lighter, cars that have a dual mass flywheel have that to quieten down or dampen the vibrations and noise in a drivetrain. An R34 GTR is a perfect example. When you have a factory clutch with a dual mass flywheel from factory, the drivetrain's really quiet. But when you take out the dual mass flywheel and put a conventional flywheel in there, just a one-piece normal flywheel, no matter how well it's balanced, the drivetrain in an R34 gets really noisy. So even when you're idling, you know, I haven't got your foot on the clutch and you're in neutral, you can actually hear the, cl the, the clatter of the drivetrain inside the gearbox of an R34 GTR. It's actually noisy and most people freak out and think there's something wrong with their car, but there's not. You've gotten rid of the dual mass fly reel, all the dampening's gone, just gets noisier. Put your foot on the clutch, noise goes away. So that's one thing to consider with a flywheel as well when it comes to going lighter or keeping it where it is. So there's a lot to them. What do you choose for your car? Well, can't have your cake and eat it, mate. So you've, you've got to choose based on the application. If you have a time attack car or a circuit car and you don't care about its drivability, go for it. Make the flywheel as light as possible, the entire assembly as light as possible. But if you have a road car, you've got to say to yourself, you know, I still want it to drive nice. So you can go slightly lighter than factory because a flywheel on its own can be pretty heavy. You can save a few kilos, but don't go too light because you want the thing to drive nice. How do you know what's right? Speak to an expert. Whenever we're specking a twin plate clutch for one of our cars, we speak to the guys from Direct Clutch Services and say, this is the power we're making. This is the way we're gonna drive it. This is what we're gonna do with it. And a perfect recent example was they offered us a lightweight clutch for our R33 GTR that we're going to be using for circuit. And I said, no, I still wanna drive it on the road and it will do some drag launches. Give me the same clutch as our R32 GTR that we have experience with. So there's a lot to consider with a flywheel and lighter is definitely not always better. Now the last consideration to look at with a flywheel is the diameter, how big it is. Obviously the bigger it is, the heavier it's gonna be. However, if you make it a larger diameter, but make it thinner or have a better material so that it's lighter, sometimes that can also work in your favor. Because if you can put bigger clutch plates on it overall, you can actually have less clamping force, but have more torque holding capacity. So the overall diameter of the flywheel can make it. Now that's not really important in most cars because you can't go any bigger than factory, but you can go smaller. So race cars can have a flywheel that's half the size of what might have been on that car from factory because all of their clutch plates and pressure plates are tiny and they might spread it over six or seven plates. So the flywheel itself can be very, very small and light in a race car. But in a road car where you're using factory style gearboxes, etc., it'd be nice to be able to go bigger in some, app some applications, but obviously there just isn't the room. And you've got to worry about the ring gear, which is what the starter motor is attached to. And you're basically confined by the size of that. So the next thing to talk about is the clutch plate. This is essentially where the friction material is that transfers the torque into the gearbox as it gets sandwiched between the flywheel and the pressure plate. Now you would have heard a lot of confusing words, organic, full face, multi-plate, multi-puck, uh, brass button, puck clutches, sprung, un there's heaps of things to talk about but essentially you can break it down into two things. It's either sprung or unsprung and then you talk about the type of friction compound it has. So this is a sprung clutch plate. And you can have a look in the center, there's springs in there, hence why it's called a sprung clutch plate. But what does it do? Well, the input shaft goes into here on that spline. And as you can imagine, as it starts to grab onto the friction material, these springs just take up some of the shock loading and dampen or smooth out the engagement of the clutch. Now, manufacturers do this for obvious reasons. It helps dampen the shock loading onto the drivetrain, so it looks after the drivetrain, and it just helps make for a smoother car to drive. 
However, if you can imagine, it adds a lot of complexity to the clutch and it adds weight. If you want to get the weight down, you've got to get rid of the springs. If you want to try and fit multi-plate clutches in, into your clutch assembly, well, you can't fit as many clutch plates in if you have this giant spring assembly. So obviously you need to get rid of that in a multi-plate clutch. And lastly, if you're going to be putting major shock loading onto the uh, clutch, i.e. clutch kicking for drifting, then you want to get rid of these. Because another thing that can happen is, if you can imagine, if a little bit of slack is built in, um, what can happen is once that slack hits the end of the spring, it then puts a lot of force as that spring binds up and can break this assembly. A lot of guys with drift cars will break their clutch purely because they've got a sprung centre. On the flip side though, there's now no give in the drivetrain, so other things can break. Um, if you've got a GTR and you're launching it, I think that you don't want to have the sprung centre because 8,000 RPM and drag radials in a multi-plate clutch puts a lot of force on that stuff. So it's another thing just to go wrong and break. So, Want a nice car to drive? Sprung centered the way to go. Factory car sprung centered. Once you start getting a lot of aggression on the drivetrain, you want to go to this bad boy. A solid plate clutch. No springs, nice and simple, stronger, lighter. So the next thing to talk about is the material. Now, you hear about the phrase, an organic full face clutch. Well, that's what this is. This is what you're going to find in 99.9% .9 of factory cars. And even for a basic upgrade, you can still do this. Why do we use these clutches? Well, they're just very user friendly. They're very, very soft engagement, very progressive in their engagement, and just really easy to drive. But on the flip side of that, they just don't handle heat very well due to the type of material they use. And they can warp, distort, break, etc., get stuck, fuse to the flywheel if you abuse them too much. So they just can't handle abuse as well as the other style of material, uh, and they just can't handle heat. What happens if it gets hot? Well, it slips. You're, you're trying to sandwich either side of it, and if, if that material, that friction can't get enough friction to hold, it will just slip in between the pressure plate and the flywheel. And what happens then? Revs go up, car doesn't go anywhere. The worst enemy of performance, clutch slip. So these are great for a factory car or a slight upgrade, for example. We have a, uh, a performance organic full face clutch in our WRX. We have it sprung so that when we launch it, we don't break the drivetrain as easily. Uh, but it doesn't make a lot of power, so this still works. As power goes up, that friction material isn't going to work. Then you start moving into things like cerametallic compounds or metallic compounds, ceramic compounds. Each cl clutch manufacturer is a little bit different in how they label it and the material they use. And the next step up from that is carbon. We'll get to that later. So when you hear people talking about a multi-puck clutch, this is essentially what they're talking about. You might have a three-puck clutch. I've seen four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, etc. Uh, the more pucks generally means the more pieces of material that you have. Now, why would you have more or less of them? Well, this, having a multi-puck arrangement like this, is still full face, is going to have more weight, more complexity. But when you have something like this, a five-puck clutch, these gaps here means you can have less weight uh, on the actual clutch plate itself. Uh, but you, you can't have the ceramic compound the entire way around because often it'll start to overheat and warp the disc, which is why you need to have it in little sections. Now you hear the word brass button, that's usually got to do with the brass design here that's below the compound, uh, and then you have the actual button itself, uh, which is kind of like a rivet, essentially attaching it there. I don't really refer to things as brass button clutches, I just refer to them as a, you know, a ceramic clutch or a uh, ceramic compound clutch, etc. But I just say it's a multi-puck clutch. So this is a five-puck clutch that's sprung. This is a five-puck clutch that is unsprung. Different clutch manufacturers use different compounds, different thicknesses. They design it different ways. There are so many variables when it comes to that. It's really hard to talk about. But these ceramic multi-puck clutches are the norm when it comes to creating a performance clutch. Now the next step up is going to a carbon clutch and other than use carbon for the construction of the plate, some of them will have a steel intermediate plate but some of them will have a carbon intermediate plate. But there's huge pros and cons when it comes to carbon. Carbon is light but it's also expensive and we talked before about if the clutch is too light you get really bad drivability. But the other problem with the carbon clutch is they don't work cold most of the time, they need to be warm. So if you have to warm the clutch up before it works at its full potential, how are you going to warm it up? Now I'll give you one example, the Forza R32 GTR that we built came with a carbon twin plate clutch in it. When it was cold, it was terrible to drive. Once it was warm, it was fine. Now we had to drag race that car one night and the car had to sit on the start line for an hour, completely cool down and I had to get in it, warm it up and go and launch it cold. 
I had no choice. I had to do it for the filming and for the crowd watching, etc. Now, because the clutch was cold, I went to launch it. It slipped for a bit, then it grabbed, slipped again, and was very inconsistent in its feel, and I lost the drag race to the HSV GDS simply because I had a cold carbon clutch. Second launch was better, and by the time I did the third launch in a row and it was warm, it worked great and the car ran to its full potential. I hate carbon clutches personally because of that exact reason. If you can't warm them up correctly, you actually risk wrecking them, breaking them, etc., uh, and you just lack the performance that you need. However, when it comes to the ultimate in having a light clutch and you really want to have that in your car for what you use it for, great, go for a carbon clutch. But personally, I think a street car or a drag car, you should stay away from carbon clutches just due to the fact that you need to warm them up before you can use them. The best way to think about these little ceramic or ceramic or metallic pucks on a multi-puck clutch is think of them like little brake pads. Now, just like a brake pad, you can have various different compounds, different manufacturers will do it differently, but essentially the compound will determine its characteristics. Some brake pads can work up to 1,000 degrees, some start to fail at 300 degrees, but some of them don't start working until they're a couple of hundred degrees either. So the range at which they work temperature-wise and how much temperature they can handle can vary between the compounds, how long they last. So a really good performance brake pad for a rally sprint in a WRX only lasts three events, but some other brake pads all last 30 events. So the compound will determine how long it will last. Um, so these are the things you've got to look at when you talk to a clutch manufacturer about the compound used here. So if you have a really long lasting, aggressive compound that can handle lots of heat, like a brake pad, it'll be really aggressive. It might wear the other parts of the clutch out quicker and it could be really grabby when you go to take off from the light. So this compound can also determine how the car drives. Um, how will you work that out? To be honest, you're going to have to talk to the clutch manufacturer uh, about the compound and a little bit of trial and error between different brands of clutch, to be honest. Uh, we've had good results with direct clutch services and their twin plate clutches uh, because the compound is pretty good. It cops a fair bit of abuse, can handle temperature, but it still drives pretty good as well. Now, the next thing to look at with clutch plates is how many of them you have. You've all heard it before, twin plate, triple plate, quad plate, etc. Hell, some race cars that have tiny diameter little clutches have as many as six or seven clutch plates. Now you've heard all this before, but what does it mean? Well, the theory is actually very simple, but let's draw it first. So this, we had a single clutch plate, so let's get rid of that. So you can see here, we now have two clutch plates, which are now attached to the input shaft into the gearbox in between the pressure plate and flywheel, but now we need another plate or an intermediate plate so that the friction material on the clutch plate can act against that. Now this intermediate plate is attached to the flywheel and pressure plate by little pins or shafts that stick out from the flywheel and hold it together. Let's have a look here. So, we have a flywheel, and these pins stick out. Not only do you attach the pressure plate to the top, so now what happens is we have the first clutch plate, we put it in like this, then we have an intermediate plate. That intermediate plate slides in, then we put on the second clutch plate, and now you can see here that essentially we've created another sandwich, so now our pressure plate slides on, and then our clutch cover, which has the fingers on it that apply the pressure, goes over the top. So what are the advantages of having a multi-plate clutch? Well, the theory is quite simple. We talked before that you can increase the amount of pressure or clamping force on the clutch to increase the amount of torque that it can hold. But the problem with that is the more pressure you put into the pressure plate makes it harder to push onto the clutch. So you just reach a point where the thing isn't very drivable. Now, what if, you had the same amount of pressure, but now you had two clutch plates. Well, in theory, two clutch plates could hold twice as much torque, right? And they could also hold twice as much heat. That is the basic principle of it. Same amount of pressure, but you can hold double the amount of torque and double the amount of heat, which means it can cop more abuse and handle more power. Uh, you go to three, in theory, could handle triple the amount. Now that's just in theory, but when efficiencies kick in in real life, it may not be exactly double. Now, a lot of twin plates, triple plates, etc. the theory is they drive easier, but sometimes they don't. But at the end of the day, it is all just a balancing act between how much heat it can handle, how much torque it can handle, how much it all weighs, and how much clamping force it has so you can determine its drivability. Setting up a clutch is really quite complicated. So the next thing we're gonna look at is the intermediate plate. This is the plate that goes in between the clutches inside a multi-plate clutch. Now this one in our car has holes in it. Why? Well, for two reasons. It takes a little bit of weight out, but what it also does, 
kind of like when you have a cross-drilled brake rotor, it allows the gases, the dust and the material that comes out of the, uh, the pucks on the clutch to have somewhere to go. They can actually dissipate more heat through the holes in this, um, which helps stop it from distorting and helps it last a little bit longer as well. There is still plenty of surface area to transfer uh, the heat and transfer the friction over to, so that just helps out with that. That's something that the guys from Direct Clutch Services do on their twin plate clutch. So we've talked about the theory, but let's look at some real world examples about how changing things inside a clutch can affect the clutch's performance overall. In front of us are two direct clutch services twin plate clutches that we've used in our R32 GTR. This one is an eight inch diameter clutch. This is a nine inch diameter clutch. Essentially, direct clutch services worked out that they could make this fit in most of the applications where this would fit inside the gearbox. Because quite often, you have a restriction overall. Now, if you have a look at them here, you see the edge here, the distance from the ring gear to where the actual assembly of the clutch starts is quite big, but this one, that distance is used up better. So they're actually efficiently using up the space a lot better on this nine inch version to the eight inch version. So let's take off the clutch covers, take off the top pressure plate. So if you have a look at the clutch plates, the nine inch one is just bigger diameter overall, but the actual size of the material is the same. Um, they basically worked out they didn't need any more material. What they did need is more heat capacity. And the way to do that is by having a much bigger intermediate plate. There's the eight inch, there's the nine inch. Let's line them up. Look at that, way more material on the nine inch. They worked out there's 40% more material in the intermediate plate, the flywheel and the pressure plate, which means it can absorb more heat overall. What they also did with the nine inches, they cross-drilled it for better heat dissipation. So it can handle the heat a lot better and it can also absorb more heat than what this original one can. Also, when you start looking at the overall diameter, bigger is better when it comes to handling torque. Now, when you see like an LS or a big V8 clutch, they're massive and that's why they can get away with holding a thousand horsepower with a single plate clutch. So by going to a nine inch, it means you've got more leverage. Like a breaker bar, you have a long breaker bar or a short breaker bar, it's a lot easier to do it with the long breaker bar. So by having larger diameter pressure plates, larger diameter clutch plates, they can just hold more torque. Um, so a nine inch clutch overall, they worked out approximately 35 to 40% more heat capacity due to the bigger uh, surface area. Uh, and they can also handle 35 to 40% more torque with the same pressure. So. Now the reason we upgraded from an 8 inch to a 9 inch clutch in our GTR is really quite simple, or well, one, we could, but most importantly, for the same amount of pressure, we have 40% more surface area to handle extra heat uh, and a larger diameter clutch plates to handle more torque. And we're going from a 2.6 to a 3.2 litre, so therefore we need the ability to handle more torque. The other thing is, we don't need as much increased pressure in the future if we want to handle even more power again. Now, like I said before, you can't always have your cake and eat it. There is a weight penalty by going up to the nine inch. This one weighs 15 kilos in total assembly, while the eight inch clutch is more like 12.8 kilos as an entire assembly. Are we going to notice an extra two, two and a bit kilos within our system on this GTR? Probably not. We're going from a 2.6 to a 3.2, so we're going to a larger crank and more mass anyway. So that little bit extra in our clutch assembly probably isn't going to be noticeable. But if you were going for every single last bit of performance, then you want to get the weight down. Now, if you look at race cars such as GT3 cars and things like that, these guys have, instead of an eight or nine inch clutch assembly, these guys will have like a four inch or four and a half inch clutch assembly. Tiny little clutch plates in diameter, so they don't have as much inertia from their diameter as well as their weight, uh, but they might have six or seven of them in a clutch assembly. Like I said earlier, they're very, very difficult to drive. Pain in the ass, but super light. So once those cars are moving with paddle shift, etc., they don't use the clutch at all. So Therefore, once they're moving, they don't matter. So they want maximum light weight. Now to put it all into perspective, our R32 GTR makes 900 horsepower. It's 1,550 kilos. It's all wheel drive, got a 275 drag radial on there. So that's a lot of friction and a lot of inertia in that four wheel drive drivetrain, big sticky tires and the weight of the car. So the clutch has to handle a lot when you're riding it from 8,000 RPM plus to take off. Now the reason some people have launch control is so they can build boost and build torque at a lower RPM so the shock load from the, through the clutch 
isn't as bad. One reason to have launch control. But either way, you've got to transfer power and torque out of that engine into that drivetrain. And you can imagine, as you're riding the clutch on takeoff, there's a lot of heat being built up in the clutch. So having a nine inch clutch with more mass and more material to take that heat is obviously going to be advantageous. It won't distort as much. It'll be able to cop the abuse and be able to do multiple launches where something like a Nismo Copper Mix twin plate, beautiful to drive, However, one big hard launch with a thousand horsepower and that thing is going to slip, it'll probably warp and it will never be the same again. So there's a lot to consider when it comes to choosing the right clutch, especially for something like a GTR, because even though that nice, friendly, expensive Japanese clutch might drive good and everyone says how great it drives, try do a couple of nine second launches on drag radials and that clutch just will not cop the abuse. So that's why we choose the direct clutch versus twin plate, unsprung, twin disc, nine inch in size and this thing just works and we've proven it with our GTR. So that leads us to our next real world example. We have a eight inch direct clutch services twin plate clutch in Jet 200 as well behind the SR20. Now this one weighs 12.8 kilos but the one in Jet 200 only weighs a little bit over nine kilos. Essentially we put more priority on trying to take the weight out. How did we do that? Well the sections on the flywheel that we could remove, we essentially just drilled a hole through it. We took mass out of it. We used different clutch plates. We drew holes in the intermediate plates. We did everything we could to get the weight down on the clutch in Jet 200. Why? Well, it has a dog engagement gearbox. So once it's moving, I don't use the clutch for upshifts. Um, and pretty soon when we go drive by wire, I won't use them for downshifts either. So we don't use the clutch really, except for taking off or going down gears. Now, when you go down gears, you're not putting a lot of load on the clutch because you don't have your foot on the accelerator. So therefore, it's not as much strain on the clutch anyway. So the flip side of that though, compared to our GTR is Jet 200 is terrible to drive. If you watch us take out of the pits at World Time Attack, it's like 5,000 RPM to get moving. So in the real world, that mega light clutch is terrible to drive, but the lightweight helps with performance for time attack. And the reason you don't want a lot of inertia in your clutch for time attack is not just from accelerating, it's like when you want to down change the gears, you don't want a compression lock, you want them easily to, the engine to easily match the speed of the drivetrain. Um, and also just basically, you know, coming out of a corner at 4,000 RPM, sustained throttle, you stand on it, you want less inertia so the thing will want to accelerate better. So for that car, it's all about performance on the track but our GTR needs to be compromised to work on the street and we want the inertia inside that clutch to help it launch at the drag strip. Like we said before, the more inertia you have inside that clutch assembly, the easier it is to take off and obviously the easier it is to launch as well, but the flip side is the weight which affects the performance once you're moving. So that's the whole point we're getting to with clutches here is you just, you can't always have your cake and eat it. Um, you've got to work out how to balance what you need for your car. If you're all about lightweight because you want to go around circuit, well, that's that type of clutch. If you're all about drivability, it's this clutch over here. If you want to compromise between a car that you can drag race and drive on the street, that clutch is over here. And if you want one that's a compromise between time attack and street, it's over here. Just a massive balancing act between the pressure plate, i.e. how much pedal pressure you have, then you can do all the adjustments in your clutch master, clutch slave, pivot point, and even your throwout bearing to get all the leverage right to determine how hard the pedal is. So some more examples are these three single plate clutches we have here. This is a full face organic sprung centered. Like I said, this is probably the best in terms of drivability. We have something like this in our WRX. Now if we increased the power to the point where the material couldn't handle the torque and would just overheat, well then we'd probably upgrade to this, a five puck cerametallic sprung centered clutch. We would want the spring center in the WRX just to help soften the shock of trying to launch the thing and gear changes because the drivetrain is quite weak. Uh, weight wise, not a lot of difference. Now if we had a normal factory style clutch in a S14 Sylvia that we wanted to take drifting, we wouldn't upgrade to this one, we would upgrade to a five puck cerametallic unsprung center because like we said before, the springs in the middle are often the weakest point and can break when you're being harsh on the drivetrain. So as you can see, there's lots of variables when it comes to a clutch. One of the things we're sick of seeing is people going to a Facebook or internet forum group and basically saying, what's the best clutch for my car? Well, there isn't actually an answer for that. What you need to tell people is, this is what type of car I have. This is the amount of torque that I have at what RPM. This is how much power I make, the type of tires I have on it, the type of gearbox. I want to use it for this type of motorsport or this type of street driving. You need all of that information so that you can actually accurately choose the right clutch for you. And don't ask a Facebook group, 
ask a clutch manufacturer or clutch retailer that makes clutches, such as direct clutch services, about what the right clutch for you is. Another factor they'll tell you about is a single plate versus a twin plate is a twin plate can be rebuilt. So even though they cost a little bit more to begin with, approximately $2,000, you can rebuild them for anywhere between five and $800. So over the life of the clutch, it actually works out a little bit better on a twin plate some of the time, just due to the fact that it's easy to rebuild. Next time you want to choose a clutch for your car, like I said, start factoring some of these considerations, but at least now you know the theory, so when that you do talk to a clutch manufacturer or talk to your mechanic, you know a little bit more about what questions to ask and can understand why they're telling you to get a certain type of clutch for your car, which makes it easy to understand and a better purchasing decision.